Welcome to Inspire, the Angel Flores podcast, where you'll be inspired, equipped, and entertained. All right, cool. So, Betsy, welcome to the Angel Flores podcast. And I want to, um, let's start out, just let's just hear your story. So born in, raised in, family, that kind of stuff. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's always fun doing um, you know, something new, trying out these podcasts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New. So congratulations on this new <laughs> venture. Um, so um, my name is Betsy Valdez. Um, originally from Pachuca, Hidalgo, Mexico. Um, kind of give you an idea, that's central Mexico. Okay. So about an hour away from Mexico City. All right. Um, Which direction? East of that. Okay. East of Mexico City. So an hour okay. away from that. Cool. Um, I was born and raised there until the age of nine and at the, at the age of nine, my parents, my younger sister and I um, came to the U.S. Um, we, uh, we came here to Greeley. Um, Greeley has been our home for the past, gosh, every time that I see it, 25 years. So it'll be, uh, it'll be 25 years this year. Okay. So 25 years here in Greeley. Um, and how did is, your, how did you guys pick Greeley? So, How did your family pick Greeley? So when my, so I guess we'll, you know, go back a little. My parents, um, so we, we lived in Pachuca Hidalgo for, you know, again, for until the age of nine. And my dad, um, beginning of 1997, my parents decided that, you know, my dad was going to come to the U.S. And he was going to work for a while. And then he'd go back to Mexico and, you know, go back to right. normal life. Let's go make some money there. and come right. back, yeah. Um, Which a lot of folks do. A lot, a lot of, of folks in our do. Spanish service do that, yeah. Absolutely. And I think that there's this idea that you come to the U.S. and you make millions and then you go back home and then, you Retire. know, like it's that yeah. easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this, th- there's this idea, right? right. And, and so I think that my parents probably had that same mentality of let's, my dad, will, he'll, he'll come a few months he'll go back home and things will be fine. Mm -hmm. Um, So he came in January. He left home January of 1997. And at the time he came with, I think it was a couple friends and then family member. Um, I think it was a cousin of a cousin of his. And I think the, the, the original plan was to go to North Carolina. Somehow along the way, really popped up. Okay. I can't really tell you why and how and but I think they were told that there was work in Greeley, Colorado. Yep. So here they come. They came to to Greeley and my dad was here for about 9 months. Okay. Probably no, probably less than that. Probably about 8 months, 7 8 months. And I think it was at that time I think it, it became apparent that it wasn't that easy. It mm-hmm. wasn't that you make millions and then you mm-hmm. go back home and then you know, life is, life is good. Yeah. 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 And so my parents, the roads, are, the roads up here are not paved with gold. No, <laughs> like, yeah. No, Did you ever see five no. Okay. Anyway, it's a <laughs> dumb reference. Anyway, keep going. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think they, they, they thought, you know, this isn't easy. It, eight months away from the family isn't yes. an easy thing. Um, I mean, I was at that time I was eight and I've, I've always been told you're very mature for your age. Mm. I think that's because the oldest? I am the oldest yeah. and it's, uh, I think often because you go through so much and you see so much, um, kids absorb and they, they they observe and absorb a lot of the things that happen around them. Mm-hmm. And I think for me, that was the case. Um, so just a little bit of backstory as well. My sister was born with, my younger sister was born with bilateral microtia. And so for those of you who don't know what that means is she was basically born without ears. She was only wow. born with her little ear, ear flaps, mm-hmm. ear lobe. Um, and that was it. And so the, there was no opening. So she couldn't oh my hear. Gosh. Yeah. Uh, when my, when my sister was born, she was born she was told, my parents were told that there was a high probability that my sister wouldn't walk, wouldn't talk, wouldn't hear just because of how severe her condition was. Mm. And so there are different types and different levels of how of the bilateral microtia, there's some that are pretty severe and some that are very mild. And so hers was pretty severe. 
I mean, you, so, you use your ears to balance everything. Absolutely. Yes. And so that's where that walking piece yeah. comes in yes. because they're like, yeah, they're, she they're, won't be able to balance if won't. she doesn't have that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is kind of what my, this is what my parents were told. Oh. And I mean, me now being a parent, I can't imagine. I mean, it, being a parent is already hard enough. Yes. I can't imagine, um, you know, just having a kid, your second child, and then being told that like, that's, like a slap in the face. Yes. Like, Boom, here what you go. just happened? Yeah. Right. And so, so that might've contributed to your dad saying, I'm going to go up there. Of course. But make some money. But this was, I mean, uh, when my sister was born, they did everything and anything possible. I mean, my, you know, my, uh, yes. you know, my sister, um, you probably would have no idea that she was born with any, anything. I'm I mean, sitting here thinking it was a different sister. So it's your, okay. It's yeah. Sister. I, yeah, I, I never would have known. Yep. yep. You probably would have successful, never known. Successful, articulate, Absolutely. outgoing. Yes. Absolutely. Um, she's, you know, my parents worked very hard mm -hmm. and I think, you know, for me, it always reminds me in life. We always, we always, um, have a decision to make either mm -hmm. you allow these things to determine and, and, um, you know, you, you allow those things to bring you down and, and determine, I feel like that's not they the word that I want to yeah. use, but that's, you know, that you allow that to define, uh, define there it. There it is. Yeah, that's the word. I'm like, <laughs> it starts with it's the right D. There somewhere, yeah. <laughs> um, you allow, you know, certain situations, things in life to define you, or you're like, no, like mm. we're going to do something different. Yes. And so for my parents, that's what it was. It's like, she's going to walk. She's going to talk. Mm. She's going to have a normal life, yes. a quote unquote normal life. Right. Because who are we to say what normal is, right, yeah. but she's going to have a normal life therapy. I mean, you, anything, uh, classes, um, she even took, you know, sign language and uh, mm. because the, okay, if she can't just talk, in case, just yes. in case. And so my parents did everything. I mean, I remember being left, um, constantly with family members because my parents were always off to Mexico city. That's where everything was happening. Mm. Mexico city to give her, you know, to the classes, to the a new treatment, a new something. I mean, yeah. Oh what, gosh. What I kind remember. of work did your dad do? Um, my dad was in, um, an electrician. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's as much as I remember. Right, I can't right, right. remember uh -huh. exactly, you know, too much of that, but he was an electrician, electrician back in Mexico. Um, and my mom was stay at home okay. with, with us. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so, so I do remember that from, from a very young age, just being left, left behind and I left behind sounds pretty. Right. Yeah. Pretty left, with, left, with family. Was left yeah. with family. Um, so my parents could, you know, um, give my sister that opportunity to, mm -hmm. you know, receive treatment and classes and, and whatever was needed, you know, but I think there, there came a time where that wasn't enough anymore. Um, you know, with my dad being the only one working and, and also taking the time to be with my sister and give what, give my sister what she needed. Right. It, it just came to a time or a point where they said, it's just not enough. You know, it's not something else needs to happen. Mm. So I think that's when the discussion of we're going to go to El Norte, you know, we're going to go to El Norte and uh, up North and make some money and then, you know, things will be fine. Mm. And so I remember that. I remember that as a child. I remember that, you know, thinking and, and I remember seeing my mom. One thing that I, I always remember as a as a child is seeing my mom trying to hide from us, but at, but not being so successful all the mm -hmm. time, um, crying, you know, just thinking, um, you know, you've heard all the stories, right. right, of people coming up north and, and chasing that American dream and unfortunately not making it to the other yeah. side. Um, because it is hard. And so that was the reality that, you know, my dad was coming here undocumented. And so, mm. you know, there was that risk. There was that people die. Uh, yeah. yeah, People die. And so I, I remember my mom crying. Have you read American and, dirt? Have you heard of that? Book? I have not read it. Um, I'm but I've heard, the... I've heard, um, I've heard it's stunning. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah. We just, Diane and I just finished it. It's on the yeah. top of my head. Yeah. And, um, you know, so that's what crossed my mom's mind. Right. And, you know, of course she had every right to, you know, every time she turned on the, the news, it's like uh, other, you know, other um, migrants or workers, you know, crossing and, and losing their life and mm -hmm. not just not making it. Um, and so that was really hard. And I remember as a child, I would tell my mom, 
mom, everything's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it was, you know, the innocence of a child, an eight year old, right. not really knowing Faith. and or understanding yeah. that this was really happening or that that could happen to my dad. Yeah. You know? My mom was like, yeah, 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 of course, you know. Um, but, you know, I like to believe that, yeah, I probably, I, I felt it. And I, and I knew that my dad was going to be okay, that we mm. were going to see him again. Um, and so when he finally made it over here again, he was here for about eight months. And then um, at that time, that's when they decided like, yeah, you know, like I'm not going to go back because eight months was not enough to, you know, like it's not millions. And then to try and cross <laughs> again. And yeah. Yeah. And so I think that it's time for you guys to come over here and, mm. and there's more opportunity and there's more opportunity for, you know, for my younger sister. And so that was the, that was that mm. we, we came, um, it was at the end of September that we decided to come to, to the U.S. How did you guys Same come? Thing. Same thing. We came here undocumented. Mm-hmm. And so we made our way up north, um, I think through the bus. And I remember we left when we um, came from Mexico. When we left our home, we did so in the middle of the night because my mom didn't want to give anyone an explanation of why we were leaving because she knew that they were going to, you know, family was going to try to convince us not to do so. Yeah. And especially with two little ones, mm. uh, seven and a nine year old. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. What are you doing? Like, what are you doing? You know, like you were just afraid that you're, you know, you're, you're. Okay, so you this. have two little girls. You have three girls, beautiful family, but you have two little ones. Can you imagine what your mom was going through in that moment of, I, I mean, this I is dangerous. Yeah, this absolutely. is, this is crazy, but we got to do, we got to do this. Like this is What's on the other side. Yes. You know, what There's is a whole the different life from if we do it. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I sit there and, you know, I think of my, of my kids and, um, oh gosh, it's, um, it's hard. Yeah, I yeah. can't. Um, Some Kleenex if you can. <laughs> my mom is a very brave woman um you know to be able to to say you know what is on the other side is better than what we're leaving behind yeah not ever having not ever um and i'm sure that she did second guess it right i think that there were moments that she's like i don't know about this what are we now. doing yeah, yeah yeah what are we doing but then thinking like you know what it's worth it um, let me let you, know. you catch your breath. I'm going to tell you a quick story. I was doing some missions work with a church in Mexico. This was, it was about 15 years ago. And I'm sitting, uh, we went to buy a pop at a little corner store, a little bodega kind of. And I'm sitting on the step with a couple guys drinking a, a Pepsi. And the Pepsi guy drives up in the big giant Pepsi truck, right? He's got a uniform on, the dolly, moving pop, whatever, right? So I just said, Hey man, I'm just curious. I don't, I don't, you know, you have to tell me if you don't want to, but um, what does a job like this start at? You know, I'm thinking this is, he's got a good job. He's driving a truck. He's got the uniform, whatever. How much, how much does this job start at? Not what do you make? Cause I didn't want, right. But how much does this start at? And he goes, it starts out at $8. And I was like, Oh, okay. Eight bucks an hour. And he goes, no, eight bucks a day. And I was like, and this was like 15, I mean, it was 15 years ago, but back then a Big Mac still costs like four bucks. You know what I mean? And I'm, and right then I was like, I would do it too. Like if if I was here and this was the opportunity, $8 a day, or let's take a chance. I like, it's easy for people to sit back and say, you know, well, we won't get into all that, but anyway, yeah. Uh, But I hear you. I Mm -hmm. hear you though, because it's always easier to, it's, it's easier to point the finger and it's like, how could, how, how could you, how dare you? Yeah unless you've been in that situation or something similar. Right. I think none of us have a, it's not our place to say that it's not our place to condemn somebody else for their choices. Right. Yeah. Because they haven't been through that. You yes. haven't walked in my shoes. We haven't, I haven't walked in other shoes. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but, but yeah, I, I, I remember that clearly. I remember when we came, I remember we, we tried crossing three separate times. Holy smokes. Um, where'd you guys cross? Um, we, and it was, hmm, my mom, one of the things that my mom said, it's never putting the girl's life at risk. Right. You know, we're so not, not doing river, this. We're not crossing, you know, it was crossing over and. We're not going to walk through the desert, that kind of stuff. Right. Um, Actually that we did, but it was through a shorter uh, distance. So yeah. it wasn't, 
you know, you, you hear the stories right, of like yeah. 12 days, 15 days, and there wasn't anything like that. It was probably at the most one day or two days. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll say that, you know, I think that we were very fortunate to be with people or a group of people who really did take care of the people that, that they were with. Good. Um, you hear of other stories where it is, it is a business, right? And it's, I don't care who you leave. They don't care who they leave behind. Right. And it's, it's just all about the You're money. a product. Yeah. You are. And, you know, I do remember that it's, you know, kids are fed and, and water and, you know, all of that. We stayed in, in, uh, in, in hotel rooms or someone's house. Mm. So it was never like, you know, we were, we were in danger. Right. 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 You know, I mean, yes, I think that there were but looking back, like, oh, you got to think, yeah. yeah, man, that was nuts. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. Um, but one of the times that I remember the most, and I think it was probably the last time that we crossed. Um, and I think that was the last time that my, my mom had already told my dad, if we don't make it this time, we're going back. Like, I'm not going to keep trying. Mm-hmm. Um, for one, we're probably already losing money because again, this isn't free either. Right. This is not, it's, you have to pay somebody mm-hmm. to kind of guide you because you don't know the way. Right. Um, but I, the, one of the last times that I, that we crossed, mm, my sister on the way lost her shoe and we always remember this because we always we, now we joke about it we're like right. we're gonna go back one day we're gonna look Find for your shoe, shoe. Yeah. yeah but we uh so my sister ended up losing her shoe and you know think of the desert right and she hurt herself and so she couldn't keep running and a seven-year-old i mean i have a six seven-year-old and something happens to them oh man it's you know they're it's the end of the world yeah <laughs> it's the end of the world and so my mom needed, we you know, obviously we needed to keep going. We were told you needed to run at this time. And there was a, um, you know, again, a, a woman with two young girls, two little girls. And my mom's like, well, what do I do? You know, it's not, I can't just carry her. You know, she, it's a seven year old. Yeah, she's a too big. Yeah. She's, she's big. There was a gentleman nearby that offered to help my mom. And so he carried my sister. Oh, wow. She accepted, obviously like pretty skeptical still, yeah. but like, but I mean, I what choice you got? Yeah. yeah. And I remember at that time, and this is one of the things, and and I'll say this just, and I, sh- I'm share, I share this because I think that there's so many things that happen in our lives that we don't think so much about. And later on in life, it shows up as trauma or it shows up as just different things that we go right, through. Yeah. And so I always link it back to little moments like that. Mm-hmm. I remember the, at that time when we were, um, my, my, it was my mom, it was my sister being carried by this gentleman and then, I, and then it was my mom. And then I was at the end and I remember thinking to myself, like I saw my mom running up in front of me and I was thinking to myself, like, I can't lose her, mm. you know? Um, gosh, no. <laughs> and I didn't obviously, but, and I know that my mom would never leave me, right, right, right. but it was, but you're a nine year old kid, a nine year old. And I was trying like, to figure what is happening? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I knew, I knew like, I can't leave my mom cause I'm going to leave left here. I'm not going to see my dad again. You know, like all yes. these things that happen or cross my mind. Um, and I didn't, and you know, we made it. We, thankfully we did make it that time. And it took us a few more days to continue to make our way up North. And then we finally met my dad. It was early October of 1997. So after nine months, almost 10 months of not seeing my dad, we finally reunited and, Mm. Um, he was here. He was here in Greeley. We we met up at a little gas station, and it's still there. Um, gosh, I don't know if it's like Fort Lupton. I don't know. Mm. Off of eighty five, mm. and you know, every time that we passed by, they were like, "Nope, that's that's where we." I met remember up. that you know, place. Yeah. I remember that place. Um, but anyway, you know, like I I think that the fear of losing my mom then it just showed up in different ways in life. You mm. know, like I. When we first arrived here, I had that fear and it wasn't, it was, it wasn't something that I could get, I could get rid of, Mm -hmm. you know, a strange place, strange language, yeah, strange everything. Yeah. I think for others, they would think like, why is a nine year old crying for her mom? You know, but when you don't understand and you don't know the full story or you don't know what they've been through, what they've been through, it's hard for you to understand. And I remember at that age, I, was, I, I would cry for my mom if my mom went to the store. Mm-hmm. I would cry for my mom if she was gone for more than an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, that fear. Yeah, that's, that fear. that's trauma. It is. and It's um, a traumatic thing for a kid, nine years old, seven years old, to be running through the desert yeah. in fear and having someone say, you have to run. Yeah. Like that's, 
not very many people can relate to that. There's not, you know what I mean? And so, yeah, I would, I would, I would, I would on one hand, I know, I understand what you're saying. On the other hand, I would, I would, I would identify with you. That's pretty serious. That's pretty significant. So yeah, yeah. you've been through it, been through some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, it is. And, and it's not something that I, that I shared. It's right. not something that even when we, when we arrived here, um, you know, we were aware, we were told about, you know, our status and, um, but it's not something that I was fully aware of as mm-hmm. a nine year old. I mean, your status, it's not like someone's going to ask you, Hey, you have, do you have an ID? You do have right. something that shows that you're, you're from here, right? Nine year olds don't carry we anything. Don't. Yeah. So that wasn't really apparent and not until, um, in high school, mm. um, you know, like through elementary and middle school. I mean, it was, it's just life. whatever. So you, just what grade whatever. did you start in? Fourth grade. Where? Jefferson okay. Elementary, Jefferson which elementary. is now a high school, but That's right. yeah, Jefferson elementary. elementary School. Um, cool. I had amazing teachers. We had amazing uh, people in our lives who helped us, who guided my parents through mm. the you know various process of I mean, like school process, and then also with my sister. Um, my sister, after a couple years of being here, she was granted a reconstructive surgery for her ears um, through the um, I can't remember the name of the program, Mm -hmm. but one of the ladies that worked there, her name is Aurora. And we have such a small world and I'm so grateful. Aurora, my God, why can't I remember her? Mm -hmm. You'll remember it when you're driving home. (laughs) I'll remember it later on. Um, But actually now that I get to work with Hispanic women of world County, a couple years ago, we, so we give um, community awards, community uh-huh. leadership awards. Two years ago, Aurora received one of our community mm. awards. Come on. And I was the one who had to call her to let her know. Mm. And it was such a special moment because I'm like, do you remember me? Do you remember my family? Do you mm. remember that you helped us so much? Did you, do you remember, do you know that you made such a difference? Wow. In our lives? Yes. Um, it's she gotta is be now her. a member. <laughs> I know. I know who she is. Yeah. Um, Aurora Actually, Medina. Oh, Medina. No, different. Aurora, Aurora yeah. Medina. Um, she works at the health department. Well, shout out to Aurora Moreno because you're awesome too. Anyway, <laughs> um, but cool. you know, I mean, That's there's cool. just yeah. so many people who. Did she remember? Oh yeah, mm-hmm. she did. Cool. Yeah, and we actually were just having this conversation the other day, last week or a couple mm-hmm. weeks ago, of how you know it's people like her, mm-hmm. and they may think that their work is so that they don't do so much, or that they, right. you know, it's just it's just work. But it's not. Or even, right? you know, my boss is a jerk or, you know, whatever, right? It's, it's at the end of the day, it's still work. It's still a job. But man, did she change somebody's life. She did. And who knows how many others. Exactly. Because I think that, you know, we can all have a job. Mm-hmm. But it's like, it's those people who go above and beyond and say, it's because that family needs my help. That family needs me to connect them to that opportunity, to this, this or that. Mm-hmm. And she did, you know, and I can say that about, many teachers who we had in, in Jefferson, mm. you know, Miss Lucero, Miss, um, gosh, Miss, Miss Dempsey, Miss, um, uh, Peppy. I mean, I, I could go on mm, about the names cool. of Ms. all these Peppy. teachers. <laughs> Hi, Miss Peppy. Hope you're I well. Mean, and, and some of them I, you know, I either work with in some way or I've, I see them yes. and I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, but anyway, you know, it, that it was life and just learning. New they just thought they were and, helping this little Brown girl. They had no idea how they were changing. No idea. Just one act of kindness. You know what I mean? Just feeling seen. Absolutely. Hey, I see you Absolutely. and let me help you. I know that you don't know how to do the lunch line. I know you don't have to know how to do that. You don't know how to open your carton of milk. I'm going to help you. But man, we remember those things. They psychologists call that imprinting. They, they, they imprint on us and they, mm-hmm. they make such a deep mark in who we are. Mm-hmm. It's, it's yeah. Anyway. Oh, absolutely. I agree with you. And it's, we may think that our words or our actions don't matter, mm. um, but they do. Yes. They do make an impact on, on, on someone else. And I know for us, we've been so fortunate to, to receive that. Mm-hmm. We have, yes. um, have we had people who have done the complete opposite? Absolutely. It's life, right? For sure, I mean, yeah. We're not, we're not exempt mm-hmm. from receiving that kind of treatment either. Right. Um, 
but you know, we, again, we chose, I guess it's choosing to focus on those people who have done so good and have been so good to us. Right. And, you know, they have allowed us to thrive, you know, at, in a, at a moment where it, it seemed like it wasn't, it wasn't possible or it was hard. It was difficult. Um, you know, but we continued, we continued with, with school. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, it was, it was in, in high school when I started to, to realize how much our status really affected everything. Mm. I mean, at that age it started to matter. Yeah. It's, yes. And it was very obvious, you know, at that age, 15, 16 year olds were getting their permits, their driver's mm. license. I couldn't get, we, we couldn't get one. My sister and I, um, job, same thing. It you was, need a social security number to get a driver's license, right. or at least you did back then. Right. right now there's a, you can get it. Now there's a different, yeah, yeah, there's, there's a, there have been, um, certain bills that have been passed that mm -hmm. have allowed, um, those with an undocumented status to, to obtain their, their licenses uh -huh. now. But at that time there wasn't, there was nothing. Yeah. Um, and I felt very ashamed and very, um, just ashamed. I think that's the word that comes to mind at that age. I didn't want to share it with any of this conversation. Never would have never happened mm -hmm. with anyone. Right. I mean, it was probably a close friend, maybe one or two who really knew about our situation mm -hmm. because they were in the same situation. Um, but no one else knew it wasn't something that I talked about. It was not something that never, never. So at um, this time, what's dad doing? Is he still an electrician? Is he? No. So in order for you to continue your, I mean, to be an electrician here, there's, there's a lot of state testing, I believe. Yeah, that you licensing. Have to go through, yeah. Licensing. Because of the status, the same thing you can't, mm. it's not something that he was able to pursue here. Okay. So my dad, ever since he's been here, he's been a roofer. Uh, oh, he's okay. been in construction, but right. mainly in, as a roofer. Oh my gosh. That's the hardest. Your dad is still roofing. Oh, that is yeah. the hardest. Oh my gosh. Day of work I've ever I had. I can guarantee <laughs> you that that man probably cannot work anyone who's half his age. Sure. He yeah. is an extremely hard worker. Wow. Still roofing. Huh? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. That's all right. I'm like, <laughs> this is like, this is probably the most um, emotional person that you'll have. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, um, you know, when it came time for high for college. So I, you graduated or did you go to high school? I went to Greeley Central. Okay. So mm -hmm. go Wildcats. Go Wildcats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when it came time to apply for FAFSA, apply for college. Um, you know, I international I couldn't student I couldn't four times the tuition. Yeah. Yep. And cash. I didn't want to, I honestly had at that time, just like, I am, I had this mentality of like, screw it. Mm. I really did. It's like, screw it. I can't do anything, yeah. you know? Mm. And it's not like I can share it with anybody because how embarrassing, what are they going to think about me? What are you going to think about me? Mm. What are you going to say about me? You know, right. you'll think less of me. Mm. Um, you know, at that age, that matters. You're still forming. Yeah. Yeah. At that, that age, it still matters. You want to have, mm -hmm. you want people to see you a certain way. Sure. Um, but I have to thank my counselor, Ms. Villarreal, who is still there at Greeley Central. Kendra? She said, yep. She said, Hey, Kendra, nope. shout out. <laughs> I actually just spoke at Greeley Central at their LULAC, um, to their LULAC group a couple of weeks ago and I was talking about Ms. Villarreal and she was there and we connected. Very so, cool. um, and we're friends on Facebook and we're <laughs> like, <laughs> um, so, you know, we maintain a, a, a good relationship, but again, it goes back to that. What we were just talking about, it takes one person yes. to believe in you and, you know, do or go out of their way to, to say, Betsy, you have to apply Betsy mm -hmm. that you do belong there. Mm -hmm. You do that. And she doesn't, you know, maybe she doesn't realize that, but she planted a seed at that time. She really did. Yes. I applied she to UNC. You. Yeah, yes. she did. She's like, Betsy, you don't have the cost. She, I remember her going through like, nope, we're going to do this. We can't do FAFSA, but we're going to do this and we're going to do that. We're going to get you in. Mm. And I, I, for me, I was like, okay, miss, like, sure. Mm. Like, okay. <laughs> um, I got into UNC. Cool. Um, but I only went one semester because I did have to pay out of state tuition. One semester of out of with out of state tuition as an out of state student you it was about eight thousand dollars plus all the fees that right. you know if you didn't pay on time which i you know, i failed to do that yes 
then it was like 9,000. And I, and, and by that time I was like, and you can't get student loans. I couldn't. Right. And at that time, again, there was like, screw it. Mm -hmm. Screw mm -hmm. it. You know, like yeah. I can't, I can't go to school. And I applied at, at Ames and same thing. I was out of state, but it was at a lower rate. So I was like, okay, at least maybe I could do this. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, it just, I wasn't fully into it because mm -hmm. I was really just, um, disappointed and I don't know it, it, when you I felt broken and like, I just don't belong there and this is not for me. And have you ever heard about when they put a piece of glass inside a fish tank? Have you ever heard of that? No. So researchers, I read this a long time ago and I might be butchering it. They got some fish, put them in a fish tank and let them acclimate to the size of the tank. Then they put a piece of glass in the middle of the tank while the fish weren't, wasn't there before. So they would bump into it, bump into it, bump into it. After a while, they would quit trying to go to that side of the tank. Then they took the glass out, but the fish still never tried to, because they, they'd been conditioned. Mm -hmm. You hit your, your face so many times, eventually you just say, screw it. Yeah. yeah. And that's kind of what it sounds like. I mean, like, if if all things had been equal and you fit into the mold that this system was designed for, you would have probably been successful mm -hmm. in and out in four years, maybe. But instead, because of all the extra obstacles that mm -hmm. you didn't ask for, mm -hmm. here you found yourself. Yeah. So you did a semester at Ames too, or I did a semester at Ames. Okay. Um then I then I I I got pregnant at the age of nineteen. Okay. So that changed. That everything. changes everything. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I was a young mother and I think at that time too, for me, it was like, I love my daughter. I love my kids, you know, but I, as you think back, it's like, man, I was so, so young. I was such a baby. Like, yes. what was I thinking at the age of 19? You know? Um, How old is your daughter? My daughter is 13 now. 13. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, where was I going with this? <laughs> so you're at Ames. Um, uh, but yeah, so then after that, I just, I, I decided like, okay, obviously I'm, I'm a mom now. Mm -hmm. My focus and my priority now right. is, is on this child. And um, to me, I felt like I'm just another statistic mm. as a Latina, as an immigrant, as so many other things. Mm -hmm. and I'm just now a teen mom. Now a teen mom. Yeah. And, you know, it was, it was hard. We struggled, you know, we were, we were broke. <laughs> we didn't have anything. And yeah. I think my, there's no broke, like teen parent broke. Oh, I've been there. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, I, you know, Nobody now, wants you, to when, you, when you look back, you're like that one, now it's laughable. Right. Because right. you're like, gosh, we were we so through. broke. Yeah. We were so broke. I mean, we didn't have anything, right. Anything that we had was from my savings. Um, and it was like an inflatable, inflatable bed and like everything was oh like a hand, hand me down. Everything was, you know, some of our rooms were, we had a two bedroom and it was, some of them were like completely empty because we didn't have anything Right. for dinner. Sometimes it was like, like, what are we going to eat? Like there's some salchichas there. So like, get, you know, like, yeah, let's figure it out. Yeah. Um, you figured it out. And, you know, at that time you're like, gosh, what did I do? You know, as a person that. I deserve this. What just happened? Yeah. Yeah. But you know, as, as you think back, I think those are, those are the moments that really teach you a lesson. Mm. Those are the moments that you're like, if it wasn't for that, I think, how would I think? I don't think that I would, um, perhaps I would be more judgmental. Perhaps I would be more this, more that. And I think those moments in life have really humbled me that I really don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not above anyone here. Right, you know? yeah. I think I've been there. I've been in the low moments. Being broken creates two kinds of people, people who are bitter or people who are compassionate. Mm -hmm. It sounds like that's the road. Oh, you absolutely. Took. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I know what it I'm feels the... like to be you and it's, you know, absolutely. Let and, me help. <laughs> you know, um, my husband, you know, um, he's, I would say that he's compassionate, but he's, you know, he has a different Are way of seeing things. Are you trying to say he's things. bitter? No. <laughs> no, I'm not saying he's Just bitter. Kidding, he's definitely hobby. a very, you know, he's a kind person. But I think for, for me, it's like, no, no, you know, we see someone or hurt someone hurting or someone going through a, 
a specific situation and I'm the one who will take a step back and like, no, wait, like maybe they're going through this. Maybe it's that right, where yeah. my husband's like, no, it's this or, you know, it's mm-hmm. that. But again, I think it's the things that we've been through that you're like, you don't know. Right. Yeah. You don't know what that person has, what, what they've been through. How did you guys meet? Um, we met at a, he was my chambelan for a quinceanera. Oh, wow. Okay. Somebody's quinceanera. Somebody's quinceanera. Wow. What and are the odds? Huh? They. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, my goodness. Like at what, at what age? How old were you guys when you met? Uh, 14. We were 14 when we met. Holy smokes. Yeah. <laughs> you guys were together a while. Huh? We, we were, we were together for a while. And you know, at the age of nine, I, I was 19 when, when I got pregnant with, with her first daughter mm-hmm. and you know, we're still together. So I, right, yeah. I think for me, that's worked a win. out. <laughs> it's yeah. worked out. Um, you know, we like each other. <laughs> the other day he told me he was 27. So I think he, he was, was lying. 27. He is not 27. Okay. Cause I said, happy birthday. And he said, thanks. I said, what are you 29? He says, I'm 27. I was like, Oh, oh. and I was like, Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, no. than I thought. yeah. Okay. <laughs> he is not 27. <laughs> Javi, you're lying. You're not 27. Javi, you lied to a pastor. That's a double sin. <laughs> right? Okay, so then young, you guys are, yeah, we've been there, man. Struggling, trying to figure it out. Yeah. Then what? Um. Then it was just. Um, how, how did you end up as a dreamer? So that was, so fast forwarding a bit, um, you know, there, all that time, it was just without, without any status. Um, you know, I had a, a few jobs here and there more cash under the table. Yeah, yes. You know, or them understanding. And, and I won't say names or anything just cause you know, I don't, you should say some names. My... Let's give some shout outs. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, you know, I just, or people who, who knew of your situation and you know, they were there to, to help us. Yes. But in, so fast forward to 2013, 2012, I'm sorry. 2012, uh, President Obama passed, um, he um, passed a bill that was a DACA. So it was Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Okay. So it was for all those children who had come here, for all those um, now adults who came here as children um, who were at no fault, right? You right, were yeah. brought here. You had no idea, but now you're, but you're still suffering the consequences of that, of those actions. Well, and right? then if, here. I mean, the, the, just the humanity side of it, mm-hmm. let's say, and, and it happens all the time. Mm-hmm. Let's say that child arrival gets deported, happens all the time. Right. And they're going back. They have no one over there. No. They don't have any life over there. Mm-hmm. Some of them don't speak Spanish and they get to like, we're going to drop you off in Matamoros. Good luck. Mm-hmm. I mean, the inhumanity of that yeah. to me yeah. is anyway. So, no, so I, that's what, that's the alternative. But I don't right? think people see that, you right, know, yeah, like yeah. people don't see that. It's like, no, you did it. You came here illegally. Like, nope, yeah. there is no way. Like you're asking for a handout. There's, you know, there's all these different things. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And um, so in, so in 2012, he, he announced that and it passed and that would that meant that about eight hundred thousand individuals here in the U.S. would qualify for DACA, and so there were so many things that you needed to, so many requirements. Mm-hmm. Like you had to be here before um, the age of sixteen. You had to have been in the U.S. when President Obama had made that announcement. You had to provide about ten years of like your school, your everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, pr- so you had to go through and do all that, but you had all that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Every, every, my parents had always said, keep everything. I mean, I'm probably a bit of a hoarder now because I feel like that's again, because of so much that we were told, like you need to save this, you need to save that. You don't know what you're going to need when it comes to an immigration reform or anything. You never know, right? So Javi just said, amen. She's a hoarder. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Oh yeah. She, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, but so he, um, what was I, what was I saying? So DACA, so yeah, you applied. So, you know, there was just so much that we needed to do. We needed to prove that it what we weren't, we had never committed a felony, that we were no criminals. I mean, so much, so so much. Plus the fee, which at the time was four ninety five. It started at four ninety five. Um, and the thing it was, you were supposed to, or you, it was something that would renew every two years. 
So okay. about a year and a half, every year and a half, you'd probably start your application, your renewal process. Mm -hmm. But every time you'd have to provide, you know, where have you lived? Where have you worked? Where have you, um, you know, just everything and making yeah. sure that you're still good to be And you're there. not committing any you're crimes. You're not committing and, any crimes. Yeah. And I remember, so I applied and I finally got my DACA when I, in 2013. And that was the first time that I had a driver's license. I was, how old was I? I think I was 24, 25. And I mean, I was Some so Some people excited. just did the math to figure out how old you are, but keep going. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you had a driver's license. I had a driver's license at the age of 24. How like did that the feel? First, oh my gosh, it was it was amazing. Like yeah. I didn't have to, I, I was driving with right. a license because I just had to yes. get from point A to point B. I had to go, you know, when mm -hmm. I did go to school, it's like I right. had yeah. to go um, and I had to do that. And now it's like, now I can be free. Mm, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, was, yeah. Out of the shadows. It was out of the, yeah. That's something that I always say. Like it really is like DACA. For many people, for me, like for me, and I know for many others, it was really coming out of the shadows mm -hmm. because it was no like you don't have to hide anymore. Right. Like, OK, you have an opportunity now. Now, I mean, it's it's called DACA, but, you know, many, uh, many refer to us as dreamers because of that idea. Right. That we're here to pursue that American dream. Mm -hmm. We yeah. truly are. And and. And like you mentioned earlier, it's not like I, I can just go back to Mexico. I have a lot of family over there right, still, right. but not a lot of them that I'm connected to. Right, yeah. And I don't know life in Mexico. I know yeah. nothing in Mexico. I mean, 25 years. Yeah. The place think, has changed is, a bit. Yeah. Yeah. This is where I, this is school. This is where I've, you know, have, I've, have, I've had my children where I got married. I mean, this is, this is where life is. Mm -hmm. This is where home is. Yeah. And for me, it, it, Doc, I just, it, it allowed me to come out of my, my shell mm -hmm. in a way, because, um, you know, I've always been pretty, pretty reserved and pretty quiet and, and I'm an introvert. So I'm like, I'm just in my little, I don't want any attention. And because again, to the status, I don't want anyone to know. Probably about me. some of that was nurturing where you were forced. Cause I don't see you as an introvert, but I could see that you. Maybe it's funny that you say that. that I'm like, I'm an introvert. Like I embrace, I'm an introvert. <laughs> <laughs> I like my, like I'm, I get people out. <laughs> yes. I get you. I'm like, oh man, I need my time because it's too many <laughs> That's people. how you, you recharge. By myself. Yeah. On in my solitude. Own. Got it. I do. Yeah. I do. See, I recharge yes. with activity. Yeah. I recharge on my day off. I want to go do something. I want to be around people. I love crowds. Oh, I like that gosh. kind of stuff. That New York City anxious. is. I love it there because that the makes me anxious just thinking about it because I am <laughs> not like that. I, I get to be with a lot of people and mm. I like to network and I like to, you know, I do like to, when it's socialize. your turn, you're okay to be out there, but yeah, when, when it's, it's my turn, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I can, you know, I can, I can talk to other people. Yeah, yeah, I can yeah. definitely communicate, but mm -hmm. I'm like, but then I've had enough and right. I need to go away. Everybody get out. Everybody get out, please. <laughs> because that's, that's just my way. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and Javi's the complete opposite. He's such an extrovert where I'm like, you're too much right now. Yes. Like you need to bring down a notch because it's, yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, for me, I think that for me, that's what DACA did. My sister also applied for DACA. And and the thing about, you know, just your your immigration status, just because that's what you are at one point doesn't mean that that's what you're going to be for the rest of your life, right? Just because you're undocumented at one point doesn't mean that you can't gain your right. status or, you know, become a resident and then a citizen. Um, things change. Opportunities change. Right. But there's a process to that, right? My sister is now, thankfully, she is now a, a citizen. Saw that, yeah. Um, you know, and it took time. It wasn't like, go get in line, like people say. Go get in line and get make it right. Do it right. Do it mm -hmm. the right way. Or do it like my grandparents did or my parents right. did. Let me just say that so, so much time has passed from the time that perhaps your grandparents did it the right way. Right. So many things have changed. Well, so I've got uh, some friends who are both undocumented. And they have kids and whatever, and they are in line, right? They've, they're, they're in line with their paperwork and they've been in line for 17 years mm -hmm. and that's not uncommon. Mm -hmm. So I know when people say, Hey, just go get in line and in line. do it right and do what you're supposed to. Okay. They've been in line for 17 years mm -hmm. and they have a taxpayer ID number, which means that they work and they pay taxes. Mm -hmm. So it's almost, to me, it almost feels so hypocritical that you can't be here 
to but you can pay tax. Go ahead and pay tax. We're going to take your money. Like it's anyway. Yeah. I don't want to get on a big political soapbox, but yeah. No, but I hear you. Yeah. Um, and you know, for, for us, it's, it's taken a little longer for, for various reasons. And, you know, we're in, still in that residency process, but you know, nothing will ever take away the fact that my opportunity came because of DACA, mm -hmm. because of being a dreamer. Yes. Um, nothing will ever change the fact that I came to this country the way that I did. All those experiences, all those different moments, like that's, that's what has made me mm -hmm. Betsy. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, um, no one will ever take that away. Yes. That will always be a part of me. The day, you know, tomorrow I, I'll become a citizen, which I'll proudly take that and I'll proudly embrace that right. because this country has given me so much. Mm-hmm. Um, but it'll, it'll never erase my history. It'll never right. erase my story. That will always stay. I love that. And, you know, it's something that my daughters, I talk to them about that, but I don't think that they fully understand like right. their kids. You know. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think one of the things that I always push or I don't know if push is the right word, but I, I want them to embrace their, their culture, their mm -hmm. roots, you know, um, we're proud Mexicanas. We are. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm a proud Mexican. I'm, I'm, I'm a proud Latina. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't take away from anything being here, the opportunity that I've been given. Right. Um, I've, I've had the question. You can, be both. You can be both. Absolutely can be. I'm, I'm Mexican. I'm a proud American. Mm -hmm. I can be both. Yeah. I, and I, I don't see any conflict in that. I don't, you know, Mex mm -hmm. American with Mexican parts, whatever. Uh, yeah, I don't see any conflict. Yeah. But and I've been asked that, you know, if I if I um consider myself American and and I say absolutely. I think some people would disagree and probably would argue because of, you know, my my status or everything, but I do. I do I do feel I do consider myself American. I feel that's who I am. Yeah. Right? Like that's what's built me and that's what's made me into who I am today. And if it wasn't for this country, you know, my sister probably would not have never had that reconstructive surgery, would right. have never had the opportunity that she had here in this country. Mm -hmm. Um, that unfortunately in our country just didn't happen. Right. You know, and um And it's not just, you know, I know your sister, I know you. It's not just that you came over here and took because you guys have given back. And I, we we can talk about that here in a minute, but but it's not just like you guys are over here. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. and you guys have given back so much to our community, so much to Anyway, yeah. So I think that's important. It's an important distinction because there are a lot of folks here who are, were born and raised here who have not given back anything. Not that I'm not trying to cause people to email me, but <laughs> you get what I'm saying. Like there, it is an important. I think it's an important distinction to make that that the dreamers and DACA recipients, man, they just want immigrants in general. Yeah, immigrants in general. Yeah. Immigrants in general. I mean, I think of my parents, and I can't think of anybody who is. I mean, they are such hard workers to this day. They're still working, you know, and mm -hmm. that breaks my heart. Cause I'm, I, you know, I think that I wish that they were at an age where I'm like, sit back and let me take care of you. Right. Right. And it'll happen one day. I know mm -hmm. it will. Um, but they are such hard workers, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, I, and when I think of immigrants and when I think of someone who's here to, have a better life, you don't risk and leave everything behind to come here for, you know, just to sit back and ask for a handout. Right. No, yeah. you come here because you know that you're here to work hard and chance. you're going to give it your all. Oh, yes. You really do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I hope that I instill that in my daughters. I hope that they see that. I'm not a perfect mother. Um, but I do hope that they see that. Right. I hope that there's things that they're able to take where like mom, you know, gosh, mom was this, or my, my grandparents were this. Um, but yeah. I mean, when I think of immigrants, I think that that's what they have. They have the heart. They have mm -hmm. the passion. They ganas, have, yeah. have the, the ganas. Exactly. Yeah. I don't. Gan if you don't know what ganas means, it's the Spanish word for like desire, but it's a little bit more, it's of a burning desire. Like the, the grit. Yes. Like grit. Um, Great, and if you word. don't have that, and and to me, I feel like that's what that's what many immigrants have. You mm -hmm. know, they and of and again, I'm I'm speaking 
of this as an immigrant myself, like you have to have those ganas to keep going Yeah, because there will be many things in life that will try to destroy you. Mm. Really do. I mean, the last few years have been so such a roller coaster that it's like, man, it's, it's exhausting not only physically, but mentally and emotionally. It's to the point that it's, it takes you to, it's, it breaks you. Right, it, yeah. it does. Um, I think everybody after the last couple of years we had with COVID, we're filming this in 2022 and COVID just, we're still kind of emerging from it. I think everybody's got a little PTSD because, you know, everybody was like, what's going to happen if I get it? What's going to happen if my parents get it? My mom gets it, you know? Everybody was walking around really scared. And so, yeah, I think that we're all tr- a little traumatized as a nation. I mean, as a world, forget yeah. nation, as a world, everybody. Yeah. So, yeah. No. So t- talk, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the Hispanic Women in Weld County and kind of what, how'd you come to be doing that? Let's talk a little bit about leadership. How'd that all happen? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think just going a little bit back to, as being and, and having that opportunity as a dreamer for me, it really, like, it really did make me come out of my shell as far as like, what can I do now? Mm-hmm. You know, like uh, putting myself out in the community more. Um, and I'll say this, I think a part of it was there was a, this loud narrative of about immigrants of your criminals, your rapists, your whatever, right? The list goes on. I know the speech. And there was a part of me that I just like, it, it made me angry. It made me like, let me show you that we're not, Mm, there was a part of me that, and I know that that's probably not always the best way to do things. Right. Right. Like don't do it for others. Do it for yourself. It's a catalyst. You know, I I felt the same way. It was right. Because for me, I'm like, let me show you Mm. that I'm not, my parents are no criminals. Right. The people that I know, I'm not saying that, oh my gosh, we are not, no. There's no criminal among us, right? No, like that would be silly and no, like, but I'm not a criminal. My parents are not criminals. Mm. And let me show you, let me prove you wrong. Mm, Love that. And I think from that point on, there was just something in me that, for me, that was the the push. And and it made me get back into my community, not get back. It made me get into my community and how can I help? started volunteering. I started getting involved in the community. I started connecting with people. Um, it, it's you also like, went back to school. I went back to school, you Good. know? And so I've been little by little mm-hmm. because, you know, life as a mom, life as three kids working, yes. and you know, it's not for me. And I know that there's others who do it and I applaud you for doing that because it's, it's hard. Um, uh, but you know, taking just a few classes at a time and I'm still, I'm still a student to this day. Um, but it really was my that. bachelor's took me 12 years. So don't. Okay, <laughs> like, good. Yeah. I'm not yeah. alone. <laughs> took me 12 years. At the end of the day, nobody says, How long did it take you? Nobody even cares what your GPA was. Right. It's you. They say, do you have do you have that paper? Yes or no? That's it. And so Absolutely. my my associates took me 10 years. So <laughs> that's Ben in our tech booth, All our right. associate that's, pastor that makes here. Me feel better. 10 years on the associate. <laughs> <laughs> Becky, but you're right. Nobody Betsy's ever like, questions okay, you. I'm doing great. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you're, you, nobody questions you. You're right. right. I think it's this little inner critic that we have in our heads right, that yeah. it's like, you're not doing it fast enough. You're not Which doing it good Which is good enough. because that's what drives us. You know, that <laughs> yeah. that's what gets you off the couch to exercise. That's what, whatever. Right. So right. that's good. But at the end of the day, I mean, it's just someday your kids will say, yeah, my mom graduated from college. She's, they're never going to think when or you know, GPA, they're not going to care what your degree was in. It's just a matter of, did you check that box? Yeah. Anyway, so you're working on it, but, but so then, yeah. so then yeah, you're so volunteering. That, that really, that really just, that was the, the push. That was the mm-hmm. push of like, I need to get out there. I need to, I need to prove that I'm not. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I think that it, a part of it is like this. Um, I had a hustle for my worth, you know, like I let me like, I'm worth being here. I'm, I'm, I'm enough to be here. I'm, I belong here. And I felt like a lot of that was just like doing the work because I wanted to, to prove that, that mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not a criminal and that I am yes. a part of my, my community that I contribute mm. to this kind of community. Yes. Um, but anyway, and so I think with time, it's just evolved into sure. It was to prove you wrong, whoever you are, you yeah, know, yeah, saying yeah. those things, but it's also, to me, it was more of, it was, it was about me. It mm. was about showing myself that I could do all these things. 
and I'm capable of all these things. And it was more of finding myself and the things yes. that I want in life. Um, and so it really has pushed me into these different things that I honestly never imagined being a part of. Mm. Um, as I mentioned earlier, like I consider myself as an introvert and I'm like, I'm just good being by myself and not being the center of attention. But at the same time, I think that there's many opportunities that have been presented that the attention has been on me. Right. And it's, um, it, it, how can I say it? I guess I've enjoyed it to the point that, that I can share a message, that I can empower someone, that I can help someone, that I can be, uh, you know, be a face to, you know, just like this DACA issue, right? right? Yeah. Like it's not this non-existent thing that happens over here and we don't know anyone who's a DACA. Like now you know that this Betsy's is, a DACA, yeah, Betsy's a, real, a person, real person, yeah. right? Like sometimes I feel like we dismiss and I say we, because I think we're in many other issues, we do that. Like, mm -hmm. oh, that happened, but I know no one, you know, it's right, yeah, yeah. not important. Mm -hmm. but when we give a face to an issue, like it becomes personal. Now, you know, that that could be your next door neighbor. Mm -hmm. It could be your kid's teacher. It right. could be that, you know, that store cl clerk, you know, I mean, it's somebody that it's you your know. barista at Starbucks that you talk to every yeah. day. Yeah. So it's not that criminal that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. well, um, it's, it's easy. It's easy to generalize faceless groups. And we do that by labeling people, mm -hmm. those people, those immigrants, those whatever, right? Mm -hmm. They're all criminals. Oh, yeah. But when it's, it's, it's easy to do that. And that's why we do it so that we let ourselves off the hook. But when we, when it's a person, when you sit down and have a conversation with a person, now we're in a whole different conversation. You know, I'm, I'm going to post in the show links, a video of a commercial I saw. Um, it's, I think it was in from England where they had people from really different backgrounds come together and they showed videos one, like one guy was, it was his, his big deal was, um, there's no such thing as transgender. And, you know, he, he had this big rant about it. And then this transgender person was part of this panel. So they brought them together and they said, they didn't know who each other were. And they, they said, we need you to build something. And it was like an Ikea piece of furniture. So that's never easy. Right. So they're, and they became friends. They're joking, they're laughing, they're talking, whatever. As it turned out, they were building a bar and then they showed the videos and they're both shocked because they became friends. So then at the end of the the, sh the commercial, I'll, I'll post it in the show links. Um, they put two, I think it was Heineken's on the, on the bar. And they said, you guys can leave if you want, or you can drink these together. And every group chose to, because it's a person. It's not a, a faceless, right? Something out there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of, um, I read Michelle Obama's um, Becoming book. Mm. And one of the things that she talks about there is that you can't hate from up close. That's when you know a great someone, way to put it. Great line. Yeah. When you know someone and you have a conversation with them, mm -hmm. it's hard to say, well, Angel, I don't. Yeah. yeah I'm, you don't you all, belong. You're, you're, one, you're of one of those. Yeah. I don't like you or this is what I think of you. Mm -hmm. It's hard to do that. Yeah. Because now you know the person. Right. Now and you, you hear their a little exactly. bit of their story and what went into it. And, and there I go, except my life has been different. You know what I mean? So. But then we can relate because even though your life is different, there are things that there's an emotion. There's something that brings us together. Mm -hmm. Like maybe you've been through that and I've been through this, but the emotion at the end of the day, that's what brings us to like, we yes. know how that feels. Mm -hmm. And I think that those are the things that bring us together. And yes. um, we're more alike. So we're, we're all more alike than we are different. Exactly. We're like 99.4% genetically identical with each other. We're the same person anyway. Yeah. Rant. Yeah, no, that's cool. So then you're volunteering yeah. and then Hispanic Women of World County. So in, with Hispanic Women of World County, I remember, I think it was in 2018. Um, I wanted to, you know, thinking again, like how can I continue to, to be involved? But I also want to be like working with, with my community, you mm -hmm. know, with my Hispanic Latino community. How can I do that? And I remember Googling and, you know, like looking for groups, like what, like, there has to be something out there, right? I mean, we have about a 42% Hispanic Latino population here in Greeley alone. There has to be something. Right. And I came across Hispanic Women of Weld County. At the time, they were meeting at the Rodarte Center. And, you know, there I think there were probably like four or five members and okay. very small meeting mm -hmm. and just kind of like, okay, like, you know, this is like, I, I'll try it out. Yeah, let me, let me visit and see. Let me visit, exactly. And it, 
And then I started getting more involved in 2019. And the vice president position at that time opened up. And I was, I guess, and I was nominated for mm-hmm. that, um, the vice president position. And I accepted. I said, well, why not? <laughs> why not? Like, it can't be, can't be that hard. It, mm-hmm. Like, it's going back to what I want to do. I want to get back to my community and be involved right. with my yeah, Hispanic yeah, yeah. Latino community. And how do I do that? And I just thought, like, this is a perfect way. So 2019, I, I took over the rest of 2019 as vice president. And then 2020 was supposed to me. I felt this is a year where I'm going to learn a lot. And, you know, everything that I need to know about being because taking the vice president, you know, that after that, you'll be the president of oh, the okay. organization. It's the incoming. Right. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, 2020, it's my year to learn. And so like, I all know what I need to do as president. Mm-hmm. Well, as we all know, 2020 happened and nothing happened in right, our yeah. organization because nothing happened with to, anything. Yeah. COVID. Right, because everything COVID just, we had to cancel everything. Mm-hmm. Um, so 2021, I, you know, new president of Hispanic <laughs> Women of Will County, but you're like, welcome to be honest, no training. Yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, and this is not to, to say anything about anyone. It's just right. like the time. It's just what like, happened. Yeah. COVID yeah, yeah. really mm-hmm. took that away from us. Yeah. Um, but here we are, here we were, and all of us were, it was a brand new board. Mm. And so we were kind of lost. Sure. Yeah. (laughs) We were kind of lost, but you know, I think one of the things that we had in mind is like, what do we, what are, what are our, our goals? What do we need to do? And how do we make that happen? Mm. And I remember one of the things, one of our conversations that we had, and I had it with our, with, with our VP now, I said, I want to exp- extend, expand our scholarships. Mm-hmm. So every year we would give, since 1999, we've given two scholarships to non-traditional women. And so non-traditional women um, are women over the age of 25. So I'm a non-traditional student, mm-hmm. non-traditional students over the age of 25 who are either going back or they're starting their educational journey. And so that was always the focus, non-traditional women, two per year. Okay. And I was like, that's good. Yeah. But we need more. Let's do more. Yeah. Let's do more. Why? Cool. Why are we not doing more? Yes. Um. And so we we said, okay. Well, what do we need to do? Um. And I'll be honest. That at first there was like, why are we going to do more? And like that's so change is scary. Right. Yeah. Change is always scary for for all of us. Yes. And so if we don't know how we're going to do it or how we're going to get there, you know, it's it's there's there's going to be a little bit of pushback. But I think eventually change is easiest for the person initiating it. And then, so I used to think I love change. I love change that I initiate, but when it's imposed on me, Mm. I'm like, wait, I'm like anybody else. So yeah. absolutely. And so I, I also try to see it from that way. Like, okay, I know that it's, I know it's not, I'm not here to change things. I'm just like, how can we make our impact better or or bigger? Mm -hmm. And it's not just me. It's a team. Right. It's a team effort. And, and so we did. We got to work and we said, all right, we're going to do high school students, uh, high school graduates. And we also saw that there was a lack of um, financial assistance for those pursuing their master's and their doctorate degrees. Mm. I believe if I remember correctly, there's only between two to three percent of Latinas who are earning their master's and doctorate degree. Interesting. Two to three yes. percent. What is happening mm-hmm. and why are we not doing that? Well, it ha- what I believe happens There's is no that scholarships for those poor guys, when it gets yeah. to that point, it is assumed that you are in a better position financially. Mm-hmm. You can afford your schooling, right. your, your education, but that's not true. Right. And I think even more so for Latinas or for, you know, for minorities, because then there's, you have to, there's, you're probably still working that full-time job. You're probably a mom or right. doing something else plus going to school. Mm-hmm. And so we're like, all right, we're going to help with that. Cool. I love that. Um, last year we were able, and we went from two scholarships. We offered 12 last year. Come on. <laughs> That's we offered, incredible. Yes. We offered five uh, scholarships for high school students, five for non-traditional students and two big ones, which we named after our founder. Uh-huh. Um, our founder um, fortunately passed away in 2020. Mm. So that scholarship, we named, we named it the Charlotte Rodriguez Memorial. For two thousand dollars for masters or doctor for those pursuing their masters or doctorate. Awesome, I love. We that. had, um, I mean, in past years, we probably received five, six applications. 
Last year, we received over 40 applications for scholarships. Wow. So to say that it wasn't, we were doing big yes. and we did big. It's we happening big. though. Yes. It's happening. Um, and you know, how do you we, guys come up with the money? Typically it was through fundraising. Okay. Um, so we have a few big e events throughout the year. One is around Cinco de Mayo, um, which, you know, we're not focusing so much on Cinco de Mayo, but more like a fiesta hispana. Uh -huh. Um, it's a dinner, dinner dance. And then we all, we have our large, um, breakfast fundraising breakfast at the end uh, in November, which okay. that is our biggest fundraiser. And then in between we have little fundraisers 2020 again, took that away from us. 2021 right. was still a very, not sure what's happening. Like are things right, opening yeah. up? Like it was still very, we all thought it was uncertain. over and it wasn't over. Right. Yeah, we heard and so, about the Delta and the Omicron. And everything. <laughs> okay. So if someone wants to connect, be involved, what's the website? So we, uh, you can find us at Hispanic women of world Okay. Um, and you know, we, we're always taking donations yes. that go directly either to our scholarship fund, um, or other opportunities, uh, other career advancement opportunities. So we also, um, we started hosting workshops mm -hmm. that focus on, you know, building that foundation for us. How to, how do you build a resume? How do you work on a bio personal bio? How do you, what's a headshot? Mm. That's one of the things that we saw um, often, especially with our scholarship scholarship recipients and our community uh, award um, winners when mm -hmm. we asked for a headshot or your bio. Many of them didn't know what either of those right, were. Yeah, You end up getting a, a Instagram a selfie. selfie up right. against the wall. looks like a and mugshot. You don't know what you don't know, right? right? And so for us, one of the things too that we're doing this year is now we are including your headshot as part of your, like a scholarship recipient or your community award recipient, Very as well cool. as our members. Man, you are elevating are the all, community. I love it. They are all getting their headshot along with their membership cool. because we want to prepare you for any opportunity. We don't know when the opportunity might show up, but better yes. be prepared than not be prepared when it yes. does show up. Right. Um, and that, I mean, speaking in real life, that happens. Sometimes I'll get an email. Hey, we want you to speak at this event, whatever. We need your headshot and your bio tomorrow or else you're going to have a blank, you know, you'll be that guy with the blank uh, picture or whatever. And so, yeah, that what you're talking about is real. That really happens. So it really that's is. Awesome. And yeah. it's been, and all of us could relate because yeah. all of us at one point were like, um, I didn't know what that was. I mean, right. when they first asked me, I remember a few years ago, they first asked me for my headshot. I was like, um, selfie. Like, yeah. Is that, is that what you <laughs> yeah. mean? Like, okay, let me just really edit. Let me find this. my senior pictures. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it wasn't, I didn't know. And personal bio, like I had a friend, shout out to Chris Garcia. Like he is that guy, man. He's a having coffee with him leader. next week. He's, he's amazing. He's uh, when I think of uh, someone who connects you to opportunities and to other people, he's Good. the guy. Uh, you know, I have opp opportunities this summer and in the past who Chris Garcia has the one has been the one who connected me. Chris Garcia cool. is the first person who helped me build my, my bio. Awesome. Cause I had no idea. I'm like, well, I don't know, Chris, like it's hard to speak, uh, talk about ourselves. Right. And when you're doing a bio, it's like, it's about you. And you're yes. like, what do I say about me? I'm, I'm, I've always been, and I still struggle with this. I don't like talking about myself. Hmm. I don't like to say, yeah. and, and maybe a lot of this is that conditioning that you don't talk about yourself. Like right. be humble, be yes. this, you know, be that. I was it doesn't just take say, anything away from it's us. It's a little though. bit, cultural, although I, I know lots of folks struggle with it to, mm -hmm. you know, you don't toot your own horn and you don't right, but, but at the same time, if you're, if you're speaking somewhere, or if you're applying for a job or whatever, you, you kind of got to let them know this is what I've done and this is what I'm capable of. And this, you know, so it's, it's Absolutely. important. So, Absolutely. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm still learning that it's, I think it's a learning process. Like Michelle yeah. Obama says, it's like, we don't just arrive at one moment in life and say, I've arrived. I know right. it all. I've got it all. Like, no. I think we arrive at one point where you're like, okay, like now I know this, but there's still this long road ahead mm -hmm. and we're never going to arrive. Like we're, we're always becoming a better yes. person. We're always that's becoming good. a better version of ourselves. Mm. And I mean, at least that's what I think of, of me. And I think that's I'm true. learning to let go of that. Like, okay, I'm not, I'm not over here. Like, me creo, you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I, I do work hard and I do de when I say I'm going to do something, I'm, I, I, I dedicate myself. Okay, so that I have two more questions. Uh, and that leads me to the first one. Are you successful? What does that word mean to you? 
Um, for me, what successful means is being a well-rounded person. That means family. That mm. means community. That means when I think of success, believe it or not, the money is not the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, is money important? Absolutely. I think mm -hmm. that it opens the door to many other things. It allows you to be generous to and give to the things that you want, the people that you want, um, organizations that mean a lot right. to you. But to me, success is, you know, I think first and foremost is, is having your family there, mm. having that support system there, um, having a community. And, you know, that can look very different for all of us, but it's, it's just building this, that foundation yes. um, and having that. I'm currently working with a, with a mentor and I like one of the things that he says is if you can't lead behind closed doors, you have no business leading outside of that. Interesting. Yeah. And, and I think that it's so true because if your family and everything in your home is out of whack, why am I going to go out there and talk to other people and say, Hey, you need to do this and that and this Plenty and that. Plenty of people do it, but yeah, you're right. But it's I, not genuine. And, and I'm not perfect. I mean, yes. I'm saying this because I probably speak from experience that yeah. there's many times that my house and my home made me feel like, Oh my God, it's, mm -hmm. I'm, I feel unbalanced. Mm -hmm. But I always think like that needs to come first. It's my family. It's yeah. my community. Mm -hmm. um, I think thanks to you, I've reconnected to my religion, you know, to God, mm -hmm. um, because I can say that for the longest time, I think I, I was disconnected. Mm -hmm. I really was. I, that was my last question. Um, Keep going. <laughs> Where's God in all of this? Yeah. yeah. I felt disconnected. Hmm. I felt like, um, I think I let other people and other people's actions take me away from, from God because hmm. I'm like they speak of God and they say this of God, but they are not acting and they're not, you know, their actions yeah. speak louder that than That guy words. is a jerk, but he says he's a Christian. Yeah. You know, you be in, I think that's probably one of the things that bug me the most is hmm. that, I'm a sinner right. and I make, I, I fail constantly. Me I do. too. But, um, you know, it's not just on Sundays that I'm going to act my best. Mm. It's every day that you will act your best. Right. And I think, I think that was one of your questions in your paper is that how does God show up and all that? I think that God shows up in all those different ways. Mm. That kindness that we had in third, fourth grade when we first arrived. Yes. That counselor in high school who believed in me and pushed me to apply and planted that seed in me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, to me, that's the way that God shows up in all the different yes. ways in your life. Um, and I it's not just on Sundays. You get to heaven. God's going to say, yeah, that was me. Yeah. Yeah. That was me. Oh, absolutely. That was me. Yeah. And you're like, oh my like, gosh, there are days that I'm like, yeah. there are times, certain things that I'm like, that was you. Yes. I love and that. it gives you chills because mm -hmm. you're like that. Mm. Not, it was nothing else, but it was you. Good. Um, and so to me, I, I think it's how do we show up like that? But every day and not every once in a while or when people are looking or when, you know, um, there are many things that I, sh I don't share on social media mm -hmm. because they don't need, I don't need people to, Oh, Betsy, you're amazing. Right, like yeah. it's not about that. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I, I, like you mentioned at the end of the day, it's going to be between me and God and the things that he sees because right, he sees yeah. everything. He sees it all. Yep. He and does. he knows your heart behind what you're posting and why you're posting Absolutely. it and whatever, right? Many yeah. of the things that I post, you know, like I tell my husband, like one of the things that he's actually called me out on, he's like, well, why do you share like your volunteer opportunities? Why do you share that on social media? Mm -hmm. It's like, I do that not for like Betsy's great. I share that because I want to invite other people to come yes. and also be a part of the community. Mm -hmm. Because before I started volunteering, I didn't think that that was for me. I thought that was for the rich white people. Mm, interesting. Honestly, yeah. mm -hmm. that's what I thought. Yeah. I didn't think it was something for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't think that us as a community that we could go out and give back. Right. But we've changed that. Yes. If you go back through, you know, my, when I share it, it's my family volunteering. Yeah. I've it's seen our that. community. It's, it's mm -hmm. nuestra gente yeah. that, is, that is out there volunteering because now they know that they too can be a part of that. Right. They know too. And there, there's something empowering about that also mm -hmm. when you help others and you know that you're helping others it's so it's so so much satisfaction from mm -hmm. that i think it's denzel washington that says you know when you give it's probably one of the most selfish things that you do because you're the one who feels that you're right. the one that gets the joy out of that yes. yes you're helping the other person but you are the one who feels it you're the one who gets the 
the most um, satisfaction. Yeah, you're the one that's blessed the most by it. Yeah, that's good. Well, with that, we will call it. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you for being here. How can people, you already shared the website, any other way that people can get a hold of you or you would want them to get a hold of you? Or Well, that's for Hispanic women of Weld County. Um, I mean, for me, I, I don't, I don't have a website I'm working on it. Um, but just social media and Facebook, Instagram, that's all I use. I don't cool. have, any, we'll post your links other. in the show notes. Yeah. So thank you for yeah. being here. Thank Enjoyed you for it. Having me. Thank we'll you. see you guys next time. Thank mm-hmm. you.